A beautiful audience here with us because we're back now with Power in Pink. This is the first day of Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and we have assembled a breast cancer panel with some of the top doctors in the field. They are Dr. Elizabeth Coleman. Give it up for her. She's a medical oncologist at NYU Wango Health. Dr. Monique James. Assistant Clinical Director of Psychiatry at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And back with us is Dr. Karen Knutson, the CEO of the American Cancer Society of ACS. And we also have a group of thrivers mm. and caregivers here in the studio with us yes. who have questions for our doctors. We're going to get those questions in a second, but we're going to give you a hand. Yes. That's right. Yes. That's right. And thank, thank you, thank you all for being here. We're happy you have questions for the doctors. And the first question is from Amy. It's for Dr. Knutz. And, um, so go ahead, Amy. Good morning, Dr. Knutz. Um, I was diagnosed with breast cancer in September 2020. I went through chemotherapy, immunotherapy, hormonal shots, and I will be taking pills for the next seven years. Um, I just was recently speaking with my friend who stopped taking all cancer medications because she could not afford it. What do we do in these situations? Yeah, I, first of all, Amy, thank you so much for the question, and you are why we are here. Um, one, unfortunately, what your, your friend is experiencing is all too common. We're, we, we have a, a survivor tsunami coming in the United States, thankfully, as the mortality rate's gone down for cancer. More people are surviving cancer, but then suffering from some of these knock-on effects, including what we call financial toxicity. We know now that that's a real toxicity, and that someone who is experiencing a hardship to pay for their cancer medicines has a worse outcome, and they will often have medications or skip medications in order to make it happen. So it's really important to know that there are resources to ask early on with your oncology team about access to those resources with the American Cancer Society and beyond to help offset some of those costs because there are things that actually can be done to offset financial toxicity. So important, I'm glad you asked. There are so mm. many, so many resources, so many resources that, that are out there. Charmaine, where are you? Okay, you have a question for Dr. James? Yes, my question is for Dr. James. My name is Charmaine. I am a seven year triple negative breast cancer survivor as of October 9th. <laughs> so my question is, through my journey of a double mastectomy and reconstruction, chemo, all the things that needed to be done um, between friends and family that you just kind of thought would be there when it mattered and they weren't. How do you manage that, especially when you're on the other side and you still have to walk this walk. Yeah, I get that. Well, Charmaine, thank you so much for asking that question and thank you all so much for being here. And uh, first of all, this is so common. Unfortunately, it's very common. It's so common that we have a term for it. We usually call it cancer ghosting. You might have heard that before. It could happen along the cancer continuum, all ages, all stages, friends, family, loved ones. Uh, so the first thing is that it's common. I usually tell my patients also as much as you can not to take it personally. Mm. So many people bring their own past experiences to you, whether it's their own experience, loved ones' experiences. A lot of it is about their own fear, their own love for you. Um, if you feel comfortable, though, there are different kinds of supports, emotional support, physical support, material support, transportation. So if, if you feel comfortable talking to that person about Perhaps we can have a different kind of relationship right now. Um, perhaps we can go see a movie instead of having this talk over coffee. However, you know, to be prepared for if that person does not want to have this relationship for any reason. And so it's also okay to be sad. It's also okay to, to grieve that relationship that that's different and that has changed right now. But however, right, to be open to new people coming into your life, mm -hmm. new people fitting that emotional support relationship that you may have missed. Yeah. Good answer. Where's Audrey? You have a question for Dr. Coleman? Yes. Hi. Nice to meet you. Um, my mom, Deb Hare, was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2018 and unfortunately passed in 2022. Um, breast cancer did not run in my family before, so what kind of gen genetic testing should I do as a young woman and what does that entail? Thank you so much for your question, and I'm so sorry for the loss of your mother. I know that that is all too common and that grief is, is extremely traumatic, so thank you for the bravery of asking your question as well. 
So many patients, most patients in fact diagnosed with breast cancer don't have a family history, but about five to 10% of breast cancers have a hereditary cause, which means that either from your mother's side or your father's side, and a lot of times people forget that you can actually inherit 50% of your genes from your father as well, you can inherit a potential risk for breast cancer or maybe other cancers. So the first thing I would say is to the best of your ability, try to assemble an understanding of what cancers, not just breast cancer, but really any type of cancer on your mother's side, including cousins as well, and your father's side. Bring that information to your doctor and ask to speak with a genetic counselor about what genetic testing may be appropriate for you because there's lots of different types of genetic counseling and genetic testing out there. All right, thank you for that. And we next we have Amanda with a question for Dr. James. Hello. Um, I was diagnosed with breast cancer in December. I just finished chemo about eight weeks ago. Uh, <laughs> I was diagnosed at 38 and I have two very small children. So what's the best way to describe, to explain cancer to kids mm. who know something's wrong or off, but don't really, can't really comprehend um, mm. cancer? Oh. Amanda, thank you for your question. It's a great question. And eight weeks out, that's amazing. <laughs> um, so, you know, kids talking to kids about cancer. So first of all, kids are truth tellers and they also say the darndest things. And so um, I think to be prepared, number one, that they will have questions. They're also observant they're also resilient but also very observant so there's a few tips that we usually um, say first is that if this uh uh, child is in your life to kind of prepare them first. So if you can say that these things are coming up, I'm going to be going to the doctor more often. I'm going to have special treatment. There might be parts of my body that change, right? You don't have to use the word cancer if you don't want to, but you can as well, right? Some of it is about giving language and of course age appropriate, right? Um, and then we also want kids always to hear this news in a familiar way. So if your family has always said news around dinner then do that if it's on a walk if it's in play then do that right this is not the time to kind of change things up so drastically but the biggest thing is that you don't want them to have questions alone right you want them to have a place to go where they can get answers and to feel comfortable but to giving them a, a warning sign that you know, something might change with my hair and, and different parts of my body would be the best well wow. these have been all great mm -hmm. great responses and very very helpful and I'm glad that we're recognizing the beautiful thrivers that we have here in the audience. And Dr. Knudsen, can I also ask us to talk about the caregivers that are with us and those that are at home, that they need support as well? No question. The science on this is very clear, that as the caregiver goes, the patients go. So patients who have a caregiver and who have a caregiver who's in good health um, do better. Uh, so you are incredibly important uh, caregivers as part of this cancer journey, and it's important to connect with each other, as important as it is to connect patients. We know that connecting caregivers is really critical. So we do offer at the American Cancer Society some resources to that. I encourage you to go to cancer.org to take advantage of that so we can help connect you to another caregiver who's walked in your shoes mm -hmm. and is helping someone who has the cancer that, that you are assisting. So really important and thank you for what you do. We have time for one more question. Let's get that from Janelle for Dr. Komen. Hello, docs. <laughs> so I'm 11 months in remission from triple negative breast cancer. <laughs> and like many women, I had dense breasts. What exactly is the next step when a mammogram is inconclusive? Is it a ultrasound or x-ray? So great question, and this has really been in the news lately because as of September 10th, the FDA has mandated that women be informed whether they have dense breasts or not. So what are dense breasts? They're very common. Almost half of all women over the age of 40 have dense breasts. It's not something that you can see or feel or that a doctor could feel, but something that a radiologist detects on a mammogram. So if you have dense breasts, such as yourself, it's important that you talk to your doctor about what additional screening may be necessary to pick up a breast cancer and pick up a breast cancer early. So that may be a breast ultrasound. In some instances, it's a breast MRI, but it's a very individual discussion with your doctor about what are the next steps that are appropriate for you. Wonderful, wonderful. Doctors, thank you so very much. Thank you for uh, being here and for being so reassuring and for the wonderful, um, it's just your presence, your presence and just looking at them and just wanting to answer those questions. And to you all as well, you're absolutely beautiful, you're thriving, and we appreciate your bravery, your strength. And your strength. But wait, but wait, there's more. Okay. Okay.
everybody here in our studio, did you see Tori Johnson and those items that she had in the deals and steals? Well, you're going to be going home with some of those products. <laughs> Dietitian Rachel Beller is here with ways to add foods to your diet that can help reduce cancer risk as well. Bless you all. Thank you.